Good evening, everyone. I am so excited and grateful that we could have so many people join us at the aquarium this evening. So thank you all for coming to this. This has been wonderful. I grew up in the Baltimore area, so I'd been to the aquarium a few times before. And every time I'm here, I'm struck just by how much diversity and beauty is in all these exhibits around us. And it's not just how much beauty there is, it's just how many weird and unexpected kinds of beauty there are. I mean, so many of these fish, I wouldn't be able to dream up even if I was in a really, really weird mood. <laughs> but it makes me excited and grateful that God created through a process that generates such a bewildering, amazing richness of beauty in the natural world around us. I think it's also clear to us as Christians from the Bible that we would be sinning if we didn't take the time to recognize the responsibilities that we're given as human beings made in the image of God, to observe the impacts carefully that our actions have on this world around us, to see how this world works, and to be proper stewardship, stewards of God's creation. So with that in mind, I'm grateful to have tonight's presentation with Rick Lindroth here. Rick Lindroth is a professor of ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focuses on evolutionary ecology and forest ecosystems. He's been a Fulbright Fellow, a Fellow of the Ecological Society of America, and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's served in numerous roles in his church, and I'm grateful that he is also a member of our Biologos Voices Speakers Bureau. So please join me in welcoming Rick Lindroth. Thanks so much, David, and to all of you for being here. It's really an honor to speak in this forum, in this location, and with this audience. A couple of uh, housekeeping uh, items here. Unlike some of the fish out there, I can't see what's behind me. So I'm going to be focusing here on the screen so I can actually see what's being projected. And also, I am tied to the stationary mic. So if I, if I go quiet, somebody in the back, raise your hand or, or yell out, and I'll speak up uh, a bit louder. So the first thing I want to say, though, is I'm really sorry. My gosh, what are you guys doing here? If I, if I was you, I would want to be out there or up there looking at that fantastic diversity of marine life. It's, it's really, really fascinating. But before we get started, I also have to come clean. Some of you over the last couple of days have asked me about my research in marine biology. So now I hate to break it to you, but I'm not a marine biologist. And in fact, I think uh, there's some irony to having... <laughs> A scientist from the center of the continent come speak about ecology at the National Aquarium. So in an effort to salvage just a little bit of street cred, I'll say that we do have our own inland seas. The, the Great Lakes hold 20% of the fresh water, surface fresh water in the world. And they not only look like oceans, but they have advantages such as being low salt and shark free. <laughs> so before we proceed, I'd like everybody to think of a one word descriptor of your experience here in the aquarium. So take just 10, 15 seconds, think of a one word descriptor, and then kind of park that in the back of your brain for just a few, mo a few moments. Philosophy tells us that there are three institutions of human civilization that have been profoundly important in shaping our understanding of the world. And those are science, art, and religion or spirituality. They are the ways that we ascertain truth and meaning about our existence. So now back to the one word descriptor. Toss out a couple of them. Awesome. 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 Uh, a couple of others allowed? Curiosity. Curiosity. Musical. 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 Magical. Okay. Colorful. Colorful. Beautiful. Wondrous. 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 Okay, great. All of, the, all of these are words that have to do with awesome, wonder, transcendence. What is it that really ties together these three main 
mechanisms, these main avenues for humans to ascertain truth about our world. It's wonder. Wonder is that sense of transcendent awe that unites science, religion, and art. In fact, actually, wonder has three components that align with each of these spheres. It has a cognitive component, a spiritual component, and an emotional component. And it's because of wonder that science, religion, and art share this really paradoxical capacity to make us feel simultaneously insignificant and transcendent. So the psalmist can say the whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, and we resonate with that. Wonder is really an extraordinary bridge that connects the worlds of science and spirituality. And that comes as no surprise to many of us in this room who, who do science and have religious belief. We see that the extraordinary creation around us and we are naturally drawn to study it, to explore it. And that's what the psalmist says in Psalm 111, verse 2. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered or studied by all who delight in them. And that process also works in reverse. Scientists are often drawn through wonder to embrace grandeur, to embrace mystery and transcendence. I really like this quote from Carl Safina, who is actually a true marine biologist, who said, I often use the word creation because I like the grandeur of biblical language. It stands for all the mystery of everything that we don't know. Now, for more insight into this connection between wonder and science, I'm going to turn to one of the world's leading authorities on that subject, and that is my grandson, Everett. Everett has known from his earliest years that I'm a scientist and that scientists do cool stuff. In fact, in his five-year-old mind, scientist is a verb. As in, hey, Papa, we could scientist those rocks. <laughs> we could scientist those trees, or we could scientist those fish. And so as I think about that, there are all kinds of powerful and wonderful lessons that I've been able to learn from my grandson. Such as, science, inve science or investigation is what I'm drawn to when I wonder. Science is a way of thinking that unlocks the secrets of the world. Science is less about knowing and more about doing. Science is engaging and fun. And science is fully accessible to the five-year-old mind. So there's a lot that we can learn, even from young kids, about the wonder of science. Now I'm going to take a short detour and give you a very, very short course in ecology, one of the sub-disciplines of the field of biology. Ecology is the branch of biology that deals with the interactions of organisms with their living and non-living environments. It's the science of how the natural world works. So the general public typically confuses ecology and environmentalism. I run into this all the time. Ecology is a science. It's true that most ecologists are environmentalists, but those are actually distinctly different, uh, different things. It's about understanding how the natural world works, not about advancing particular environmental causes. So ecologists study interactions, and relationships and networks. My wife, who is in the audience, would probably beg to differ, but I'm really a relationships expert. <laughs> and ecologists were studying interaction networks a hundred years before Facebook was a thing. So let me give you a couple of examples. If we were to ask a non-scientist to think about a marine ecosystem, to picture it in his or her mind, and then if we could peek inside, inside his or her mind, this is probably what we would see. <laughs> Note the emphasis on individual charismatic organisms. We think of creatures. But if we were to ask the same question of an ecologist to picture a marine ecosystem, this is what we would see. Complicated and boring. 
uh, two descriptors, I must admit, that have probably been used for me. So more appropriately, what ecologists think about are these types of diagrams or images. Organisms, but really the interactions that tie those organisms together. So why am I making such a big deal about ecological interactions? Precisely because it's those interactions that lie at the intersection of ecology and evolution. They're where ecology and evolution meet. So ecology and evolution are sister sciences. At most major research institutions, they are coupled together in one department, departments of ecology and evolutionary biology. Now we know that evolution is the theory that purports to explain two things. First of all, it, ex it explains the origin of life, how life came to be. And that's the defin of definition of evolution that is widely held and understood by non-biologists. But there's a second component, a second definition that is much less widely understood. And that is, it's the theory that purports to explain the diversification of life. So why is life so extraordinarily diverse? Why are there 400,000 species of flowering plants and not 4 million or 4,000 or 40? Why are there more species in tropical regions than in temperate regions and in temperate regions than in Arctic regions? And the answers to all of these questions lie in ecology. So ecological interactions operating over long time periods give rise to new life forms and give rise to that pro proliferation of biological diversity that we see on Earth. So let me give you just a couple of examples to see how this works. And the first example is the evolution of lake trout in the Great Lakes ecosystem. The Great Lakes adopted their current form really quite recently, only about 4,000 years ago, following retreat of the last glaciers. And lake trout were early inhabitants of this system. And due to the disappearance of interconnecting rivers, they had very few predators. And so over several thousand years, lake trout evolved into many different races and multiple subspecies. Some of them lived in the shallows, some of them lived at depths of hundreds of feet. Some of them fed on plankton, some on crustaceans, some on other fish. Some of them reproduced in the spring, some reproduced in the summer, some reproduced in the fall. Some of them were one foot at maturity, some of them were four feet at maturity. So this vast diversity of fish that arose only over a period of only 4,000 years. Commercial fishermen knew these varieties as bay trout, black trout, moss trout, shoal trout, red fins, yellow fins, buckskins, and many others. Given sufficient time, these races would have evolved into discrete species. And in fact, and I was delighted to see a display of this right upstairs, that's what happened with the evolution of 250 species of cichlid fish in Lake Tanganyika in Africa from a single ancestral form over 10 million years. So that's what leads to the diversification. It's the ecological processes, ecological um, specialization that over time gives rise to this, this um, large number of species leading to biological diversification. Let me give one more example, and that is how the ecological interactions between plants and herbivorous insects give rise to new species. About half of the higher species on Earth consist of plants and the insects that eat them. And much of this diversification is actually due to an evolutionary arms race between plants and insects. So over 145 million years, plants would evolve new chemical defenses, things that you're actually quite familiar with. Caffeine, nicotine, cyanide, strychnine, morphine, heroin, all of those were evolved in plants as defense compounds, mostly against insect herbivores. But along the way, insects would evolve counter adaptations that would allow them to feed on those plants. There is not a single plant in the world that is impenetrable to all insects. And all along the way, we see this spinning off, this diversification of one species after another. And so if we look back in evolutionary history, 
we can, we can see these parallel phylogenies or parallel evolutionary histories of plants and insects. So on your right here, we see the evolutionary history of a group, a large family of mint plants. And the closer that those species are on that evolutionary tree, the more closely related to each other they are. And on the left side, we see the evolutionary history of a group of beetles that evolved to feed on those plants. And if you could fold that left side over, you can see how congruent it would be with the right side. So that's strong evidence of, an over, of evolutionary processes coupled together, or what we know as coevolution. And all along the way, it's spinning off these new forms of plants and insects. So that's what gives rise to the vast diversity of life around us today ecological interactions operating over long time spans. So the world displays this tremendous biological diversity, but apart from its aesthetic appeal, so what? Is it valuable? And the answer is, of course, extraordinarily so. So biological diversity enhances the productivity and resiliency of ecosystems. It safeguards the services that those ecosystems provide. Those services are valued at an amazing $124 trillion a year. That's 1.7 times the global GDP. What are some of those services? Things such as provision of food, of fiber, of medicines. Something like 70 to 74% of our medicines are derived from plant-produced products. Air and water purification, crop pollination, disease prevention, soil formation, climate control, and it provides a hedge against future famine and disease. Sadly to say, this biological diversity is now endangered like never before in human history. We're entering what's called the sixth extinction. The natural or background rate of extinction is about one to five species per year. Currently, the rate is somewhere 1,000 to 10,000 species a year. That's approximating one per hour. Population declines of mammals, of birds, and fish, and reptiles have averaged 60% in the last 40 years. And a very recent study that just came out showed that 41% of insect species are in decline, and a third of them are endangered. Previous mass extinctions were caused by asteroid impacts, volcanic eruptions, abrupt climate change, and other natural factors. This extinction event is similar in magnitude, but different in cause. This one is entirely, entirely human caused. So, for example, the over-exploitation of natural resources or habitat loss due to things such as agricultural intensification, pollution, and, of course, climate change. What are the consequences of this loss of biological diversity? Well, simply the loss of all of those services that biodiversity affords us. But in addition, in addition to those utilitarian losses, I like to think of the loss of wonder, a diminishment of opportunities for wonder to help people to engage the transcendent. That's what the science tells us. And then I have to ask myself, how am I to respond? And as a Christian and as an ecologist, I really resonate with these words of Aldo Leopold, a conservation biologist from the mid-1900s, who wrote in a Sand County Almanac, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to laymen, an ecologist must either harden his shell and make believe that the consequences of science are none of his business, or he must be the doctor who sees the marks of death in a community that believes itself well and does not want to be told otherwise. Well, he presents two options here. Harden your shell or become a healer. But I don't think those two options exist for Christian ecologists if we fully understand what our charge is to take care of the creation, I think we have to move toward becoming healers of striving to work alongside God
to care for that creation. So let's take a moment here and remind ourselves of the Christian theology of creation care. As for all theology, let's connect it first to that bigger story, that cosmic meta-narrative of which we're all a part. So here we have the story in short form. God created a paradise and placed humans in it. Humans rebelled, and the consequences of that fall reverberated throughout the world. Nothing is as it was intended originally to be. But God provided a savior, a hero, in Jesus Christ, and the redemptive work of Jesus initiated the process of restoration. And God called all of us to be part of that restoration mission. So the gospel, the good news, then, is not simply creation, fall, redemption. It's creation, fall, redemption, restoration. It's the much bigger story of how Christ paid the penalty of all sin, of all injustice in the world, and the story of, of how God, through his called out people, is working to restore everything back into relationship with himself. So a proper understanding of our creation care, I think, is embedded in understanding God as creator. Our role as stewards of creation emerges from that understanding. So as, was, as is recorded in the first chapter of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. God's very first instructions to humankind were to cultivate and care for his world. So to know God as creator then means that I will worship him as creator and also that I will celebrate and take care of his creation as he has ordered us to do. A proper understanding of creation care also hinges on our understanding of God as redeemer. We see that the redemptive and restorative work of Christ extends beyond humans to all things. So as Paul wrote in his letter to the Colossians, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. So to know God and worship God as redeemer means that I will love what he loves and that I will participate with him in his work of redemption and restoration, bringing shalom to all of the world, to all of creation. And finally, our work as care caretakers of the earth is central to God's command to love our neighbor. Jesus summarized all of the law in these two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now we know that the effects of environmental degradation are experienced most by those living in poverty and those subject to social injustices. So to truly love my neighbor as myself means that I will live out the reality of the interconnectedness of all of life, human and non-human. It means that I'll reduce my environmental footprint so that others can flourish. And it means that I will work to advance environmental and social justice for current and future generations. Now, given what I would argue is a truly Christian ethic of creation care, we should expect Christians to be leading the way in efforts to address our various environmental crises. But sadly, that's not the case. For example, in a recent Yale University survey, they found that fewer than 10% of American Christians think that global warming is a religious or spiritual issue. Why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, we could talk about these for hours, but let me just present a few. First of all is poor theological foundations, the poor understanding of what it means to worship God as creator, God as redeemer, and to care for my neighbor. Worldviews of Christians have been largely co-opted by materialism, and by politics. Christians connect with environmental issues based on their tribal identities. And environmental issues are stuck in a cultural divide. They're communicated in ways that historically 
have engaged the moral foundations of liberals, but not of conservatives. There's a language barrier. So we could ask, where is the informed, coherent, compelling, conservative narrative on fill in the blank, loss of biological diversity, pollution, climate change? Because there could be one. But largely, Christians, especially I would say conservative Christians, have given up and, and allowed others to take over that caretaking ethic. So you may be asking, what will an ethic of creation care require? Well, nothing short of transformational change at all levels of human experience. And we could spend hours talking about this as well. Shortly, it means changes at the levels of individuals, of families, of faith-based communities, of schools, of corporations, and of governments, local, state, international, national, and international. If you think back of the major environmental issues that have seen significant improvement over the last 30 to 40 years since, for example, Nixon and the formation of the EPA, we've seen significant improvement in many things. Who talks about acid rain anymore? Uh, we've had, we have much clear, cleaner water, cleaner air. Uh, the ozone hole is diminishing. So how many of those major, major advances and improvements in care for our environment were effected without national and international governmental intervention? Zero. Not a one. So we have to agree that at some level, governmental uh, intervention is required. So is there a reason for hope? Well, of course, uh, to all of us in this room, the answer is yes, God will eventually restore all things into proper relationship with himself. But what about in the interim? Well, I love these words from St. Augustine, who wrote, hope has two beautiful daughters, their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. And it is this hope that should compel us to care for and steward the creation around us. Christian hope then should compel us to both anger and action. Indeed, it's that hope that I think Paul writes about in his letter to the Romans, where he says the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So let me close with just a few more thoughts. When we come to understand that every creature inhabits a physical and spiritual universe that is inextric inextricably linked to our own, that in taming the earth as we have done, we must also learn to tame ourselves, that in caring for the earth as we have been charged, we are also caring for ourselves, our neighbors, and our children, then we will have begun to understand, to comprehend what it means to live out our call as stewards of God's creation. The challenge before us is how to move the Christian community in that direction. How can we employ both rational and emotional intelligence to shape values, to modify behaviors, to transform lifestyles and worldviews consistent with an earthkeeping ethic? And how do we do so without challenging personal and tribal identities? Who is going to step up and lead? Who will be the biologos of creation care? Those are the questions that we must address for both the flourishing of humanity and for the sake of the world. I certainly don't have all the answers, but of this I am confident. By God's grace, we could scientist that. Thank you. <laughs>